You're listening to a sermon originally recorded by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Check us out online at sumc.co. And if this sermon blessed you, be sure to share it with someone else. Thank you so much for listening. Now, on to the message. God is going to show up for us, and God is going to engage with us in these stories if we're open to them. And God's going to move us to a different place than where we are right now. By sharing our stories, we enable one another and encourage one another and empower one another to have greater faith, you know. Um, and uh, I, I think there's real great hope in, in that, that these stories still continue today. Yeah, so we all have these great stories. Hey, he appeared to me also. Here's my story. Here's what happened. Take it or not, but that's what happened. There are a lot of different people that Jesus shows himself to. And it was an amazing thing, time and time and time again, how Jesus showed up. I think he's, he's looking forward to doing that today. Good morning. My name is Jake. I'm an associate pastor here at Schweitzer. It's a blessing to be here with you this morning and try not to get too excited when I say this, but we are about to read about the biggest but in scripture. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 through 53, and we're going to get straight to it to give you some brief context before we start reading that. Like Bob said, we're in the last week of our message series, he appeared to me also. We're looking at stories um, of the resurrection, right? So all of these different accounts throughout the gospels after Jesus was crucified, before he ascended into heaven. Okay, now this is Luke's account of the first time he appeared to all of his disciples in one place. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So he's explaining to them, they're still in disbelief. They're saying, what's going on? We don't understand all of this. He's telling them, look, this had to happen. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. I wanna pause right there. Jesus opens their mind to understand the scriptures. He says, I had to suffer, I had to be crucified. On the third day, I had to be raised from the dead, and now my ministry will continue. Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in my name to all nations beginning here in Jerusalem. You've seen these things, you're a witness to these things, and he says, you're gonna be a part of these things now, right? So this right here, what we're reading, is kind of Luke's version of the Great Commission. You know, we always refer to Matthew 28 as, as the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go therefore and baptize, uh, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, etc." right? That's a great commission. But this is kind of Luke's version of the Great Commission, where he's saying, you now, my disciples, are going to be the final fulfillment of the prophecy, right? The things the scriptures have been talking about are not just about me, but they're, they're about you being a part of this mission, you're gonna carry this out and the promise of the spirit that the father has been promising all throughout the Old Testament, he says, will be coming to you. He will be sending his spirit to you. And then here's the but. But stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Now essentially, Jesus says, don't go anywhere Don't do anything, stay here until you are clothed with the power from on high. There are two questions that I have, the first of which is why did God not send the Spirit immediately? Why wait? Why make them wait? Wouldn't it seem to make sense for God to get his mission going? 
Let's get to it. There are people suffering. The world needs us, God. God, you've got a mission. You've given us a mission. Give us your spirit. Why wait? What are we waiting for, God? On the same note, why, uh, why did God make Abraham wait 25 years after leaving his people before blessing him with his first son, with his wife, Sarah, Isaac? Why did he wait 40 years uh, with Moses in the desert, or rather, why did he make Moses wait 40 years in the desert as a shepherd until he was 80 years old to send him back to Egypt and save the Israelites, right? Why? Why? Why didn't he send out Paul on his missionary journeys for years until years after he was converted? Why? On God's green earth, did God wait until Jesus was 30 before he began his earthly ministry? Guys, I'm only 26. Jesus was 30 before he began his earthly ministry. Why wait so long? If that doesn't make you scratch your head a little bit, there's something wrong with you. We could come up with all kinds of potentially legitimate reasons as to why God waits and why his timing is best and why in all these different scenarios, good reasons why God would have waited. But it would all be speculation at the end of the day, okay? The fact is that God tells them, Jesus tells them here to wait, which leads me to the second question. If the disciples hadn't waited, would they have been clothed with the power from on high anyway? If they hadn't waited, would God have sent his Holy Spirit anyway? If Moses had just uh, gone back to Egypt himself, before God had sent him to go save the Israelites on his own, would he have been able to save them anyway? I'd... If Jesus had just began his ministry at 25 instead of 30 without the, the prompting of the, the Father and the Holy Spirit, what would, have, what would that have looked like? What would have happened, right? I'm gonna ask the question again. If the disciples hadn't waited, would they have received the power of the Holy Spirit anyway? There are two stories that I want to do, I want to give you here. Uh, the first is more metaphorical, and it's about a bird. Okay, uh, I was, I was uh, in my front room a couple of weeks ago, and my wife is sitting there with me, and a bird flew into the window. And we got big windows, I guess, and so it thought it could go through. So it flew into the window, and, uh, and it landed in a, upside down in a bush, and it looked injured. And so I went outside, and I got kind of a broom and, and got it out of the bush, whatever, very gently, and it fell down onto the ground, and it appeared to me as if the bird's leg was broken or something, or a wing was broken, or whatever, it was twitching, it looked like it was, it was hurting, and it wasn't gonna go anywhere, and so I walked inside, and I told Kayla, I think you're gonna have to kill this bird, and I'm just kidding. I... <laughs> but I did say, I think I'm going to have to, to kill this bird, I mean, just out of a mercy, you know, it's just, or otherwise it'll, it'll sit there suffering for days, and I, just, I don't know how these, I've never killed anything like, other than like bugs before in my life, and so, but out of just, sheer sissiness, I waited 20 or 30 minutes, and, uh, and I went back outside to do the deed, and the bird was gone. It had gotten up. It was by some miracle or just misread on my part or whatever. It, it, it had flown away. Now, what would have happened had I not waited? Out of being full of compassion, you know, uh, full of the love of Jesus Christ, for the love of creation, in the name of God, I would have bashed this bird's head in for mercy's purpose. You get what I'm saying? Had I not waited. That's the first story. Second story, as I'm preparing this sermon, um, I was collaborating with David Freeman, who's preaching in the other services today, and we had done our due diligence in the text, and we had studied the text. We knew this was the scripture we were going to preach on. We'd spent days, we'd each personally spent hours with this, and we'd analyzed, and we'd, we'd prayed, and we'd, you know, all of these things. We got together, and we talked for about an hour getting nowhere, and we realized that we were just kind of babbling on and on and on and on. Um, and getting nowhere, we still had no idea what God wanted to do with the sermon. And so David suggested, how about we pray and ask God? It's like, oh, great idea. So he opens his, 
mouth, we stop, he opens his mouth to pray. He says, Lord, and I, I kid you not, he says, Lord, and I knew in an instant what this sermon was supposed to be about. Lord, bam, God just, he, he directed my eyes to verse 49. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. It was like my eyes were open. And David continued to pray for another two or three minutes. And I sat there just kind of waiting for him to be done. So I could tell him that God just, he very clearly, this is what we need to be praying about. We both discerned that and, and said, yes. Okay, God. After almost an hour of talking, in one second, when we gave God room to speak, he spoke. We were reminded in that instance of the importance of waiting on the Holy Spirit. Now, see, when you, regarding preaching in general, the hardest part about preaching is not the, the crafting of the message. It's not the standing up here in the public speaking. It is the waiting on the Holy Spirit. It's really difficult, but mostly because it's not usually that quick and easy, all right? It's not usually just like you pray and a second later God tells you what you need. It usually requires that you wait. And I have spent uh, countless hours um, on, on sermons trying to force the word of God into submission and craft some great message. And it's not until the day of sometimes that God says, this is what you need to say. And it's, but it's so tempting to make it happen. It's so tempting to say, God, let's get to the point. Sunday's coming up. That's a temptation. It is real. But look, what would happen if I didn't wait? What would happen if I, we preachers, didn't wait for the word of God or rely on the Holy Spirit? Let me tell you what would happen. You would be a bunch of sorry souls listening to another sorry soul, a 26-year-old kid from South Dakota with a degree in logistics and his own thought. I mean, you know what I mean? They'd be my own thoughts. What, what is there to gain from that? But I'm here to tell you, if there's one thing that I've learned from, from preaching alone, is that God does speak. His spirit is alive, his spirit is active, and I am not special. Pastor Bob's not special. Jim's not special. Jason's not special. The Apostle Paul wasn't special. St. Peter wasn't special. We are human beings who have a relationship with God who listen and pray and wait for the Holy Spirit and God speaks to us just like he desires to speak to you. And if you think it is, it is just so bold for me to say that I have the word of God as I speak to you when I come up here and speak, then what do you think happens in this place? Why do we gather? What do you think... What do you think the heart of the Christian faith even is? It's about a relationship with God. We'll get more to that in a bit. Now I wonder how much we do as individuals and as a church that is void of the Holy Spirit. This might be another bold t statement, but I think we tend to assume that because God sent his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to those Christians that he's sent it to all of us too, just by association of, as being Christians. I think we tend to assume that because he sent them on mission at that time and that day that ever since he's been sending us on mission with no seasons or periods of waiting and praying and doing nothing. We make that assumption. We're ascent people. Do you think maybe, just maybe, there are seasons just like this where God tells individuals, where God tells groups of people, whole churches to stay and wait until you are clothed with the power from on high. Our mindset is too often that the Holy Spirit follows us wherever we go empowering us to do whatever ministry he's called us to do. And I'm telling you, that's, that's not how it works. But we think, making the assumption that because we have the Holy Spirit, 
that we should just strategize and make smart goals and make plans and read self-help books and, and church strategy leadership books. And remember, we do all of these things assuming that we have the power of the Holy Spirit as if the Holy Spirit is some commodity. But let's be real with each other. Let's be real. I, hope, I, I don't want to offend <laughs> any of our uh, intellects or our theology or our spirituality or whatever, but I've got to say it. Let's be real. When you read the scriptures and the stories in the scriptures about the works of the Holy Spirit, do you not see a difference between what happened then and what happens in our church and in our world here today now? And now look, I've, I've done it myself a thousand times. I've over-intellectualized and, and I've mythologized these stories and kind of made sense of them in my uh, modern enlightened mind and why, why those things don't tend to happen. But look, there, I, I just have to say it. Let's be real. Our church today in the world is void of the power of the Holy Spirit at least in this area of the world. You see, the Holy Spirit moves. <laughs> These things that we read about in Scripture are still happening in other areas of the world, but not in, not in this area. It happens in cases. Look, I mean, I've, I've personally experienced physical healing. I, I mean, that, this stuff happens, but on a broad scale, are you seeing it? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? This isn't, this isn't a criticism of any, I mean, it's, it's just, it, we gotta come to terms with this. I've got to come to terms with this. I've got to stop pretending like these things didn't happen. I've got to stop pretending like God must not want them to happen. There is something missing in our church today. There is something missing in my life. And I have a hunch that there might be something missing in your life too. And I'm afraid that we've gotten ahead of the Holy Spirit in our ministry to the world, assuming that the Spirit just follows us wherever we go. It is time for us to acknowledge this and it's time for us to wait until we are clothed with the power from on high. Now what, you might ask, should this waiting look like? Let's finish reading our scripture. Verse 50 through 52. Then he, Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them and while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. When you hear the word to wait, if God told you to wait, what would you go and do? I have to admit, my first uh, re response to that command would probably be to go and like watch Netflix or something. <laughs> I mean, go and wait, you know, just. The disciples devote themselves to continuous worship, to praise, to prayer, and they wait with great joy and expectancy and they do this together. The first point worth making is that they didn't do nothing. They didn't continue with business as usual. They didn't just um, say, okay, God, you've got nothing for me that I'm just gonna go about my life as I would if you weren't in it. No, they take this time to center themselves on the source of life. They take this time to deepen their faith in God, to deepen their relationships with one another. They go to the temple, they stay, they worship, they pray, they rejoice. Again, together, and they do this continually, waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. What is the heart of of your religion. <laughs> if it's not that, then it is not 
the life that God has called you to. If the heart of your Christian faith, if the heart of your religion and the way you live out that faith is, is simply attending worship and asking God for things occasionally or even daily and just a simple belief that he exists and being a good and moral person, I'm sorry, that faith is good for nothing. I have to say that. The heart of religion is praise and worship and a relationship with the living God. Jesus Christ did not hang on a cross for you to simply know that he exists. Jesus Christ did not hang on a cross for you to attend worship and just do Bible study here and there, just ask him for things here and there, or to simply remind you that you should be a good person. Jesus Christ died on the cross to remove the barrier between you and God that you might live with such great joy and peace and love in your heart, with such amazing, incredible intimacy with God, that your life would just be an overflowing example of what God planned for all of humanity. That's the heart of religion. So, <clears throat> last, uh, so two weeks ago, we had a staff planning day, planning for the fall. It was unlike any planning day I've ever been a part of in, in any business or, um, or since I've worked for the church, um, and I think it was new for us too. And let me just tell you the format of that day. We got there, the 20, 24 of us-ish, and um, Pastor Bob led it, and he talked to us about discerning the Holy Spirit. How do you discern the Holy Spirit? And he said, every one of you has a voice on this staff. And there was, I mean, there was everybody from um, people in facilities management to pastors to the kids. I mean, there's every kind of person on staff. But every one of you has an equal voice here. Um, and we are together going to discern how God is leading this church forward in the fall. Really incredible experience. And so then uh, we broke up into groups of five and we spent about an hour, first hour, in those groups of five, um, individually sharing, taking time, praying and waiting and listening uh, for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And then we'd share together what we had. And then each group would present kind of what, what they felt God was saying, how, how God was leading the church. And then we together as a staff came up with what we feel like God is saying to the church. And let me tell you guys, the, the, I mean, you can't make up how consistent this word was between 24 different people, broken up into five different groups. You know how, how many people uh, mentioned a new ministry or a new mission that we should take on as a church? Zero, not one. You cannot make that up. Not a single person heard anything that day about a new mission or a new ministry for this church. Not a single person heard any word that even insinuated go. How is that possible? And let me tell you, the staff had no idea that this is the text that we were preaching today. If this is not a word from God for the church, I don't know what is. Let me show you the statement that we crafted that day. We asked God, Lord, what do you want to speak into the life of Schweitzer? And he said, I'm calling you to prepare for blank. We're not even sure yet. Something big. By radically relying on me and each other. You see that community again. Praying boldly and expectantly and waiting with joy and patience. That was what the staff came up with in the first half of the day. Waiting, praying, relying on God, learning to discern his spirit. Joy and patience, community, it's all right here. And then we ask God the second half of the day, what should we do about this? 
And let me tell you, with amazing consistency, you cannot make this up. We said, God, what should we do about this? Can you give us something concrete like that we could do in the fall? And there was nothing, nada. Two hours go by, us trying to discern, God, what could we do? And, and Bob and I, we even talked about this. We're kind of going crazy. Like, does anyone have anything concrete that we could do? And no one had anything. It wasn't like we had a ton of suggestions and we just couldn't come to a consensus. Like God was saying nothing. And it's a bit because it's time to wait. It's time to, to center ourselves on him, to get back to the heart of worship, to pray for something huge to happen and to discern where the Holy Spirit is leading us as a church and as individuals. So what does this mean for you and for me and for us? Well, I simply don't know. I don't have a specific, what it means is get back to the heart of worship. What it means is to reconsider everything that we're doing and ask ourselves, have we gotten ahead of the Holy Spirit in living out our faith? Are we living void of the power of the Holy Spirit, of the guidance of the Holy Spirit? And one last word I wanna say is on community. I've mentioned that a few times. Um, is that part of this whole equation is that you cannot know God completely apart from community. You, you cannot. You cannot know God apart from true Christian community. And I'm just gonna say this truth, no matter how you feel about it, if you don't understand that statement, then you don't understand the will of God for your life. If you don't agree with that statement, you don't agree with the will of God in your life. You need to know that the will of God is for you and for me, for us, to be together in community as one body, serving primarily one another in his image. So what does waiting on God look like? I really love this image of uh, being a waiter, I was a waiter in college for three years um, at Doe's Eat Place, but the old one, the old steakhouse. And um, so I know what it's like to wait tables and waiting on God's not doing nothing. I think it's kind of like, uh, it's like as if the, the Holy Trinity were a table, you know? And you're a waiter and it's not about asking God, will you help me with this? It's about going up to God and say, how may I help you? And there are seasons where God says, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, and he helps us with that. But there are seasons like now where God says, there's nothing I need from you, but come and sit with me at this table and share this meal. It's here at this table where we remember all that God has done for us. In the giving of his body, which was broken for us. In the shedding of his blood, which was poured out for us for the forgiveness of sins. It's here where we remember that God has invited us first and foremost to simply receive and be and abide in him. He calls us to relationship, he calls us to worship. He calls us to love, and he first loved us. So Father, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these blessings of bread and of juice, that they might be for us the body and the blood of Christ. Help us to be for the world, the body of Christ. 
and also for one another. God, you call us, you have called us into a season of waiting, into a season of deeper prayer, deeper reflection, deeper community. We want to be um, obedient to that word. So help us, lead us, and guide us. Teach us to discern your will. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.